Imagine the Great Lakes 10,000 years ago, the land gradually beginning to recover from the ravages of repeated glaciation events. Life returned slowly at first, but it started to build as the intersection of biology and geology gave birth to ephemeral landscapes with ephemeral plant communities growing upon them. Dunes is the story of ecological succession. In fact, here at the tip of Lake Michigan is where the idea of succession really started to take shape. As the glaciers retreated, they exposed a barren landscape of rock and water. Streams and rivers slowly dumped their sandy contents into the lake and wave action deposited it upon the shores. Once exposed, ceaseless winds piled these sands into hills called dunes. These sandy dunes invited only the hardiest of plants to put down their roots, but that is all it takes. Lakes are by no means stable ecosystems. They change. Even with its immense size, Lake Michigan is no exception to this. Because the shoreline has been gradually retreating over time, we see varying ages of sand dune communities only a few miles offshore. On a single stretch of trail, a hiker can travel back in time thousands of years. Welcome everyone. We're here at the tip of Lake Michigan and we're here to tell the story of succession. How one ecological community makes way for another. And our story is going to start here at the beach. And it begins with, well, that right over there. Come join me. Everything we're going to cover today starts with this species right here. This is called marum grass, and it is one of the most important dune building plants in this entire ecosystem. You can find this species growing everywhere from the Atlantic coast, throughout the Great Lakes, and all the way to the Pacific. It is a super resilient grass species. Not only is it very tough to avoid being blasted by sand and cut down before it has a chance to reproduce, it also handles being buried by sand very well. As winds whip off the shoreline, they bring in tons of sand and pile it up, and this plant just gradually gets buried, buried, and buried, but it just keeps growing and growing and growing. This can reach stem lengths of up to 20 feet or more in some of the deeper early successional dune communities. What's more, this very fibrous root system is what's actually building the dunes. As you can see here, what's eroded out a little bit is still holding on to tiny grains of sands. It is remarkable how resilient this plant is. And it's one we owe, again, the existence of this entire ecosystem too. So let's move on and see what this sets the stage for. The early dunes. These are the youngest plant communities. The stretch of shoreline offers some of the harshest conditions to plant life. Anything surviving here must have a hardy disposition. So here we are on the leeward side of the dune. You can tell things are already starting to look a little bit different. This area is slightly more sheltered from the brunt force of the winds ripping off of Lake Michigan over there. And that changes the types of vegetation that can establish. The grass that you see here is mostly little blue stem, and that's not a dune builder per se, but it's helping that successional process along. What it does is it gets established after certain earlier successional species set the stage, and its roots grow deep down into the sand, further stabilizing the dune and allowing other plants to also establish. Not only does it cut back erosion, but as it dies back, it starts putting organic material into the soils and changing that sandy, nutrient-poor conditions into conditions in which other plants can establish. So with any luck, we'll find some plants that are easily accessible that we can look at and talk a little bit more about this leeward side of the dune community. Newer dunes are extremely dynamic habitats. And I mean extremely dynamic. They're constantly shifting and changing as the winds blow them around. And any plant that has to grow there is either very tough or it lives a very short life cycle. And here is one of those right here. This tiny little mustard is the sand cress. And it is a very short lived either perennial or usually a biennial, meaning it grows vegetatively its first year, flowers, sets seeds, and dies the second year. It just can't stick around on the landscape long enough, so it relies on its seed bank to carry on the next generation from year to year to year. Nonetheless, it's a beautiful little plant and surprisingly delicate for an area that's getting sandblasted constantly. I'm always amazed 
by the plant communities you'll find in these early dune successional habitats. If a plant has any hope of sticking around for a longer period of time in these early successional dune habitats, they also have to be tough. And two great examples of that are right here in front of me. This is the yellow flowered pecoon, a member of the borage family. It's got a wonderful aroma and just what's not to love about these bright yellow tubular flowers. Gorgeous plant, great for pollinators, extremely tolerant to drought. And on the right here, we have wormwood, a cousin of the sagebrush. It's actually a member of the aster family, which isn't readily apparent, but again, both of these plants are supremely adapted to life here in these sandy soils. If you look, they've got hairy, narrow leaves, which reduces water loss. Their tap roots go deep down, hold on to the soil, and access water, even though it doesn't stick around very long. And just gorgeous plants overall. So nice to see them. And these aren't the only drought-tolerant plants by a long shot in this ecosystem. In fact, I'm looking around here and I could see more. Let's go look at some over here. Now, what could be more drought-tolerant than a prickly pear? Now some of you may be surprised to see a cactus living on the shores of the Great Lakes, but nonetheless it is supremely adapted to these dune-like conditions. Despite there being a huge body of fresh water and plenty of rain, these are drought-prone soils and you don't get more drought tolerant than a cactus. As you can see, these are doing really well here. They're surviving the regular burns that come through this area and they're even getting ready to flower. In a few short weeks these will be alive with insects. Such a beautiful plant. Now another member of these sort of mid-level successional species that might surprise you is this one right here. This is the pasture or Carolina rose. It is one of our native rose species and as you can see roses look vastly different when you're not breeding them for multiple petals. It kind of has this low ambling growth habit probably to keep it out of the way of the wind, keep its center of gravity kind of low so it's not getting disturbed too much but it's a gorgeous little plant, has a wonderful aroma and it's just thriving out here. I can look about the landscape and see tons of it, and many of them have rose hips chock full of seeds. So it's doing quite well in this sort of mid-successional dune habitat. Great find. The Mid Dunes. Now I don't want to give you the impression that succession is necessarily predictable. The process certainly is, in most cases, however it's the players that change. This right here is one of the most exciting botanical finds in the Lakeshore Dunes community. This is the critically endangered pitcher's thistle. Now, life has not been very good for this plant ever since humans started settling these shores. It's got a weird lifespan of about three to eight years before it actually flowers, and then after it flowers, it dies, which means it only gets one shot at reproducing. Now, it's adapted to this highly disturbance-prone habitat, but too much disturbance, such as trampling or a lack of the erosive forces that keep competition to a minimum, will actually remove this plant from the landscape. And again, it's not doing very well anywhere in its range, although Lake Michigan does provide one of the last strongholds for this plant. Now, the sad part is, is that as the populations get smaller, their seeds become more and more vulnerable to things like finches, which eat them. If there was a lot of plants, a little bit of seed predators, not that big of an issue. But as their populations continue to decline, seed predators become more and more of a pest. For now, we're gonna enjoy this plant from afar. Getting too close to it would be really detrimental to its health. And with any luck, a dedicated team of restoration practitioners will be saving seeds and reintroducing new plants across the habitats of this great lakeshore community. Now every once in a while, Mother Nature hits the reset button on the secession process. And this is a really good example of that. This is what we call a blowout, and it's specific to sandy habitats, especially dunes. Something caused an erosion event here, and you get a steep slope that the wind can then come in and pick up more sand and just creates a lot of erosion. As you can see, a lot of the grasses are the early secessional species that again can adapt really well to those hyper disturbed environments, but even so, you still have plenty of shrubs along the rim holding on to it, and even some species are well adapted specifically to these blowouts. They have harder tissues to keep from being sand blown. It's a pretty remarkable microclimate that some species do incredibly well in.
So here we have three common woody species that you're going to find on these mid-successional dune communities. We have the cottonwood here, down below we have a juniper, and right here we have one of my personal favorites, the wafer ash. It is not actually an ash, but a member of the citrus family, and it is a host for the giant swallowtail butterfly. Now, this species is really great because, again, its roots get down, they hold on to the sand, and it provides a lot of detritus to help build up those organic layers. The juniper down below here provides a lot of berry-like cones for different kinds of birds, but it also is a dune stabilizer. It grows on top and keeps erosion, especially from wind and rain, from taking away the dune sands before anything else can establish. And, of course, the cottonwood. Now, this tree is super early successional because its seeds simply cannot germinate without sunlight. So this likes to grow in sheltered areas where enough sun gets down and warms the sand and allows its seeds to germinate. But once it gets going, it's a fast growing tree and it's really prone to disturbance habitats. Little bits of branches can break off, land into the sand, and actually root and create a whole new tree. It's a pretty remarkable species and one that deserves a lot more respect than it gets. Now as we move farther back from the lakeshore, it's like we're going back in time. And as you can see behind me, as you get older and older dunes, you get more and more vegetation. Those early successional habitats grade into later successional habitats, like we saw on the leeward side of the dune. And as more and more vegetation starts to build up, the microclimates start becoming more and more favorable to a wider array of species. Trees like oaks, tilia, and even cottonwoods can become established and they set down the roots and really hold onto that soil. And again, all of their detritus from the leaves to the twigs adds more and more organic layers to the soil itself, allowing more and more plants to become established. Research has found that actually trees initiate the succession process, allowing shrubs to get a root hold and then further grading the dunes into more of a forested habitat like you see behind me. But down here you get more of the scrubby stuff mixed with a lot of herbaceous vegetation. And this is where things really start to look more and more like a forested ecosystem. The old dunes. If a dune community could ever be called stable, this is such a community. Here we see that shrubs and trees have fully established themselves and myriad understory plants are thriving. Here on Lake Michigan, fires both past and present maintain these forests as open oak savannas. As you can tell, the vegetation community has changed yet again. In fact, the dunes we're standing on now are many thousands of years older than what we saw closer to the beach. And here's one plant that's doing extremely well. This is the wild blue lupin, and it is a species very near and dear to my heart. Now, despite the fact that there's more organic layers in the soil, it is still nonetheless quite sandy around here, and plants living here have to deal with a lot of drought, hence the overstory is a lot of mixed oaks and hickories, but the lupins are especially good at growing in these poor sandy soils because they have a deep taproot. That taproot produces nodules that house special bacteria that can fix nitrogen and enrich the soil, which is to the benefit of many of the plant communities around here. Now without fire to regularly clear out this area, these species get readily crowded out and shaded out and they just don't do well with competition. Now this species used to be widespread in eastern North America, but today it's fragmented into small pockets like what we see here along the shores of Lake Michigan. This is the sole larval food source for the Carner Blue butterfly, and when this plant disappears, so does the butterfly. Hence, the Carner Blue is considered an endangered species. Historically, lupin has gotten a bad rep, but today we're really starting to appreciate its role as a, an important component of this sandy ecosystem. So happy to see this plant doing so well here. We're standing here in a grove of jack pines and their presence on this landscape is pretty fascinating. They're an echo of our glacial past. 
because they established here probably right after the Wisconsin Glacier retreated when the climate was a bit cooler, and they persisted here ever since. Along with these jack pines, you also find bearberry, another northern species that does pretty well in these sand dune habitats right off the shores of Lake Michigan. It's a special moment to find them because, again, you'd have to go farther north, well into Canada, to actually see them again in any numbers. So given enough time, the process of succession, at least in this neck of the woods, leads to forests. And as you can see behind me, we've got a beautiful black oak savanna. These are some of the oldest dunes in the region, and they're a good representation of what historically a lot of the Great Lakes shorelines probably would have been in this area. The sandy soils hold enough organic matter, but nonetheless, we still have drought tolerant species like these beautiful black oaks. Cherish these habitats. The ones that still remain need your help and they need your attention because this is a dwindling ecosystem that in the light of everything that has happened, we're lucky to still have a part of.